Now, hello, everybody. Some of you have joined um, a bit later than what I saw, so hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Um, this is the fourth part of my fourth talk of the series um, on Bacon and the Rosicrucians, and it's titled Revelation of the Rosicrucian Work and Outreach to Europe. And that's what I'm going to focus on this time, the outreach to Europe. Um, there's an awful lot to say about how what Bacon did with his group in England, but I'm going, I shall leave that for another time. This, this is particularly to show you um, the importance of what was done abroad. And, um, and maybe you'll see some reasons why, why this happened. And of course, the main impulse of the Renaissance with the knowledges it carried and so on, the wisdom in it, um, came from Italy, spread through France and Germany and so on. So there were many groups already interested in these things, but it really took flight, as it were, in, in England. And so the group in England that was formed there in Henry VIII's time still, still carried on into Queen Elizabeth's time with more members. They're the ones who actually called themselves first the, the uh, Society of the Golden and Rosy Cross. They were the historical Rosicrucians. And why they became extra special is because they prepared and then adopted the very work that Francis Bacon set in motion, that this is the whole point of it. And then that's what spread from there, uh, from out of England into Europe at a key moment in time. So this is what I want to try and present to you as best as I can in this, in this talk. Um, so the last talk really ended uh, uh, towards the end of the 1590s, uh, and then, um, which was all the Shakespeare period, that, you know, the main birth of, of Shakespeare and the Shakespeare group with their work. And then came a very, very big change, because in 1603, March the 24th, 1603, Queen Elizabeth I died. And onto the throne came King James VI of Scotland, becoming crowned as King James I of England. And he was the one, actually, who united England and Scotland under one crown and called it Great Britain. It was, it was a Scots chap who united England and Scotland, not the other way around. So I like to put that straight, because <laughs> some people forget their, their history. Um, but he was invited to become the King of England. The English invited him. And so that's what took place, a pretty big change when you think about it, suddenly adding another kingdom to the kingdom that already existed. So you've got a double kingdom, a bit like the Gemini effect, which the whole Shakespeare um, plays and, and sonnets and poems and so on, they're all got behind them, this Gemini theme, this twin theme. So the fact you've got the United together the kingdoms of Scotland and England under one crown, it's another kind of Gemini theme, pretty important to those in the know who are working with this whole wisdom tradition. And then almost immediately after that, certain celestial phenomena happened in the sky. Now these were powerful events and certain powerful events are taken note of as markers in time and it gives a clue to the mystery schools, the wisdom schools who are working as best they can with time. Time is known as the great initiator. And so one has to know what to do at the right time and so on like that. You've got to, you've got to get the right thing to do, but then you've got to have the right timing for it. And then, then it goes successfully. And um, so, in 1600, the, the beginning of this happened when a nova in Cygnus, the constellation Cygnus, was first sighted. Now, this nova in Cygnus is now known as P. Cygni, if any of you are interested, and it's initially exhibited a magnitude of the third degree and remained practically without change until 1606. And it was still visible in 1623 with the, age of, with the aid of a telescope. Now the star, it's called a new star at the time, it hadn't been seen before, it lies in the heart of Cygnus the Swan, just to the southwest of the star Sade, 
which marks the center of the, nor of, of the Swan or the Northern Cross. In accordance with successive appearances, the Nova in Cygnus is now recognized as a variable star rather than a Nova. And it belongs to an extremely rare group of stars called luminous blue variables. Eruptions of luminous blue variables are accompanied by the ejections of vast amounts of matter. And one day it will become a supernova or even a hypernova, so the astronomers say. Anyway, it was first sighted in 1600 and it kept, it was very, very bright. And, um, and people took note, you know, they felt, felt it was significant coming from the heart of Cygnus the Swan. Um, it's rather, rather important, especially to the Shakespeare group. Then in 1603 to 1604 took place the rare conjunctions of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars and Venus in the sign of Sagittarius in the ninth house. These were forecast by Paracelsus and so they were already pre-calculated and people were prepared for this, looking, looking for this to happen. And they happened. And they included a great conjunction, in Latin, a conjunctio magna of Saturn and Jupiter. Now that's important because a conjunctio magna, a real, a proper one, is a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, which generally lasts long enough for Mars, the third of the major planets, to approach closely the other two planets thus presenting a very conspicuous spectacle, three bright stars shining from the same place in the heavens. So on the 18th of December, 1603, Saturn and Jupiter had a great conjunction in Sagittarius. And on the 26th of September, 1604, Saturn and Mars were conjunct in Sagittarius, plus a massing together of Saturn and Jupiter still. And then, on the 9th of October, 1604, there was a triangular massing of Saturn, Jupiter and Mars in Sagittarius with Jupiter and Mars conjunct. Now, you know, some people might say, why is that important? Well, we've just had a, a great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter and a lot of people were very excited about it and thought it was the start of the Aquarian age happening. So people take note of these things. But this one in 1603, 1604 was extra, extra special. And it was astrologically important because it took place in Sagittarius, which is one of the three signs of the fiery trigon. Now the German mathematician and astronomer, Johannes Kepler, calculated that this fiery trigon, great conjunction in Sagittarius, was the first of two such fiery great conjunctions the next one to occur being in 1623 in Leo. Okay, you're beginning to see the importance of this, why people took note. Um, just, just think what was published in 1623. <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> well, after that, it would be uh, another hundred years to the next fiery one, which actually took place in 1703 in Aries. So in other words, the 1603 and 1623 fiery trigon great conjunctions were twins to each other, the Gemini again. Now, in rabbinic and Kabbalistic tradition, it's said that such a conjunction of Saturn, Jupiter and Mars indicates an appearance of some kind of the Messiah. And if it includes a double or triple conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, then the messianic appearance or manifestation is significantly stronger. Kepler calculated that a fiery trigon great conjunction had occurred in 7 BCE and proposed that this was the Bethlehem star that the Magi followed, the Magi being astrologers from Chaldea. And Kepler published his story and his calculations in his book, De Stella Nova Impeda Serpentaria which means on the new star in the foot of the serpent handler. He published this in 1606. <clears throat> As if this wasn't enough, in 1604, a supernova occurred in the constellation of Aphiacus, which is also called Serpentarius. And this was called 
or is called Kepler's supernova because Kepler was the first one to really observe it, pick it up, although others did too. And Kepler started observing a new star in October the 17th, 1604, when he was working at the Imperial Court in Prague for Emperor Rudolf II. And he tracked it for an entire year until October 1605. And this, this new star was described as being blood red in colour and appeared between Saturn and Jupiter in the right foot of the serpent handler of Firecus or Serpentarius. This exact position was actually in the leg of a Firecus at the apex of a tight triangle with Saturn and Mars conjunct Jupiter at the base. It was bright enough to be seen during the day for over three weeks and outshone all the stars and planets except Venus in the night sky. It continued to dominate the night sky for 17 months, after which it faded away. The Kepler star was actually the last supernova observed in our galaxy up to the present date. Kepler identified this star with the star of Bethlehem, which led the Magi to the child Jesus. but with a difference, of course. And it's to do with the, um, the constellation of Firecus or Serpentarius. In Greek mythology, Serpentarius represents a snake held by the healer Asclepius. So the whole constellation is the healer Asclepius holding this snake. And the snake is representing a healing process. It's actually associated with the Kundalini. So the, the healer is the, the master of the Kundalini, in other words, an illumined being. 1604, the year 1604, thus had all the celestial phenomena happening all at the same time. A nova in Cygnus, plus the rare planetary conjunctions, plus the supernova in Ophiuchus. And it was celebrated by many people as the fourth day of creation, a new creation, equivalent to the fourth day of creation when the sun, moon and stars appear in the firmament as signs and symbols to us on earth. So this was a very, very big event. I can't emphasize enough. I'm gonna try and show you a map now to give you indication where it, where it is. So I'm gonna share my screen. So I hope you can see that all right. Now the three major planets and the Ophiuchus supernova were all massed close to the AA axis, what I call the AA axis of the celestial zodiac and near the center or heart of the Milky Way galaxy. This is this position here, which I'm pointing at now on the star map. So on the cusp, of Sagittarius Scorpio, very, very close to that cusp, which is where the meridian of the Milky Way crosses the ecliptic. Now this is important because when the mid midwinter sun is on that cusp, on the ecliptic, of course, um, that's when the birth of a new great age is said to occur. Um, and that's actually happening right now. So in other words, what happened then is like a forerunner or foretelling or heralding, if you like, of what's happening now. On this star map I'm showing you now, this red dot here is the position of the midwinter sun in 1604. Hope you can all see it in the bow of Sagittarius. So that's the midwinter sun. Now it's moved down to the cusp, the exact cusp point of Sagittarius and Scorpio. And that, according to the mystery tradition, marks the beginning of a new great age, roughly 26,000 years made up of 12 ordinary ages. Huge thing. So this occurrence occurring right there on this cusp was like a marker. It's in, well, people understood it then as the marker heralding this, this new time. Hence there came into being a prophecy concerning Elias, 
or Elijah, who prepares the way. Now, this prophecy had already been given, in fact, by Paracelsus. So Paracelsus probably wouldn't have known about the supernova going to happen unless he was able to do some magical things <laughs> and, and see ahead, ahead of things. Um, but anyway, he, he was certainly inspired and to know that the conjunctions that took place of the planets um, represented this birth of this new Elijah, Elijah or Elias. He called it Elias the artist. So drawing on medieval Jewish and Christian traditions, dealing with the expected return of Elijah, Paracelsus made his famous prophecy based on his knowledge of these special planetary conjunctions that were to occur in 1603. His prophecy foretold that these conjunctions would mark the advent of Elias Artista, Elias the artist, a precursor or herald of the Messiah, a master alchemist and a great light who possessed all nature's secrets and who would renovate the arts and sciences, teach the transmutation of all the metals and reveal many things. And this prophecy of Elias Artista was then advanced by the French millenarium and Kabbalist Julien Postel, an acquaintance of John Dee, though they knew each other very well. Now, Richard Burton, the scholar, Oxford scholar Richard Burton, in his Anatomy of Melancholy, published in 1621, which he wrote under the pseudonym of Democritus Jr., stated that the early Rosicrucians expected the coming of the master alchemist Elias Artista. Um, so they were wait, waiting for this to happen. Let me just show you a picture of this conjunction here, another sky picture, just to give you a better idea in terms of the sky that you might look at these days. So there you see Mars, Jupiter and Saturn close together and this supernova happening. Um, in this right leg of Ophiuchus. Um, this, this, these stars here carrying on actually make the, the serpent itself. And this, this is the cusp. This is the cusp of Sagittarius Scorpio at this point. So here's the title place, page of the Anatomy of Melancholy, or the frontispiece they call it, but it's also acts as the title page, um, which is an interesting one. I want to show it to you because while I talk, you can look at it. It's based on Kabbalah again, as some of you will see straight away. Um, well, in this, Rog Richard Burton names Elias the artist and Fra CRC, the Theophrastian master of the Rosicrucian fraternity, as one particular person who was alive in 1621, and who was not only the quintessence of all wisdom, but also the instaurator of all arts and sciences. Now this to me and other people who've researched this, particularly Baconians, this is a very, very strong reference to Francis Bacon, of course, because he was the instaurator of all the arts and sciences. That's what he set out to do, and that's what he's acknowledged as doing, even by the Royal Society when that was founded in Charles, Charles, King Charles's time. So in a subtle brief confirmation of this, Francis Bacon himself stated in aphorism 93 of book one of his Novum Organum, published in 1620, that he was the herald of the new time, the Bacchanatal Novi Tremporis, the herald of the new time, the time of paradise on earth, ushered in by the last ages, when the thorough passage of the world and the advancement of the sciences are destined by fate, that is by divine providence, to meet in the same age. These are his words. The thorough, when the thorough passage of the world and the advancement of the sciences are destined by fate, that is by divine providence, 
to meet in the same age. So he's talking about the end, what Jesus called the end of time or end of the age, which is happening right now. And I mean, the virus we've got at the moment, the pandemic is stopping all our travel, but, and now we're missing it because we're so used to traveling all over the world whenever we want, just boom, 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 in all over the places. That's, that's what was foreseen. Hadn't been invented then how to do it, but that was foreseen would happen at this last period of time together with the advancement of the sciences, which, which, which is thanks to Francis Bacon and all those who followed on from him, that's what we've got now. Science is very, very important as being proved, and Susan pointed out as being proved by the wonderful um, antidotes to this virus to try to prevent human race being wiped out basically. The other thing it was referred to was the opening of Fra CRC's tomb. Fra CRC is the father of the Rosicrucian fraternity. So 1604 in particular was seen as the year marking the opening of Father Fra CRC's tomb. And this was um, announced very much in the Rosicrucian manifestos that were published in 1615 and 1616 at Cassel. The farmer was published in 1615, that means the fame of the fraternity of the Rose Cross, and the Confessio was published in 1616, a confession of the fraternity of the Rose Cross. Um, and they were published at Cassel in Germany. <clears throat> Fra CRC was called the father of the Rosicrucian fraternity, and CRC it what can mean several things, but the main thing it means is Christian Rosy Cross. Christian Rosy Cross, the Rosicrucian fraternity, who are actually following, practicing the teachings of Jesus Christ, the ancient teachings based on love. Um, because they're also the Orphic teachings, Dionysian teachings, and so on, that the God is love. So this is what Christian really means. Now the fra, F-R-A, fra, is short for frater, Latin frater, which means brother. But it can also mean, and did mean, according to John Wilkins, it also means Francis. John Wilkins, he was a Freemason, a principal founder of the Royal Society, whose declared instaurator was Francis Bacon, he states in a footnote on pages 236, 237 of his Mathematical Magic, published in, nine, in 1648, Ludovicus Levives tells us of another lamp that did continue burning for 1,050 years, which was found a little before his time. Such a lamp is likewise related to be seen in the sepulchre of Francis Rosicross, as is more largely expressed in the confession of that fraternity. So there are little signs, there are other signs too, but little signs all trying to give the message of who was this great Elias or Elijah. And, um, and also one should note, like, like with Jesus, he came with his disciples. It was a group, group event, but led by the great one, the master. And so it was with Elias, Elijah, whenever he comes, he comes with, with a group to help him. Now, Robert Flood, who's very involved with the Rosicrucians, an English person, Robert Flood, in his Tractatus Apologetica, published in 1617, he said that these signs in the sky were, were a sign for the Rosicrucian brotherhoods to emerge from the period of secrecy that had begun in 1572, during which they had prepared their work and to expand their membership and begin the restoration of the world. I mentioned this in my, one of my earlier talks in this series. So the, the group, actually named themselves around about 1570 as the Society of the Golden Rosy Cross. And they began their work as soon as the 
great supernova in Cassiopeia appeared in 1572. And Michael Meyer, who, who um, was in England um, quite a long time, he, he says in several of his books about this, but in his Apologeticus, published in Frankfurt in 1617, he said it was a sign to the Rosicrucian Brotherhood to emerge from their period of secrecy that had begun in 1572, during which they had prepared their work and to both expand their membership and begin the restoration of the world. So although centered in and originating from England, the Rosicrucian Brotherhood then started to found corresponding chapters of their society throughout Europe starting in the Protestant states of Germany. So this is what I want to really deal with in this talk. And this is quite important. I'm showing this, this map because it's based on researches I've done with my friends. But the, the whole of Europe, it's, it's, it's called Europe from the myth of, of Europa and the bull. But this is a... a, 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 a a summary, if you like, of the greater myth that's the Dionysian myth, where Dionysus starts off being born as a bull, his parents is, are a bull and a, and a cow, like, like in, in ancient Egypt, Horus is the bull, bull calf, born of parents who are symbolized as a bull and a cow, um, Osiris and Isis. But well, it's the same with the, um, the, this myth, Dionysian myth, uh, the child is born as Zagreus, as a bull calf, attacked by the Titans, torn to pieces, but his heart is rescued and raised up or ascended to heaven by Pallas Athena, the spear shaker, and it becomes the swan. So the bull becomes the swan. And we found out in Europe and following the traces of what the early disciples did from Jesus, who set this whole thing in motion, and then it was carried on by the mystery schools, I found out during, during the centuries that followed, <coughs> working with this myth in order to bring it to a climax at this moment in time that we're in, in right now, where um, the child's agri can be born and become the swan. So there are, it, there is the swan landscape temple in Europe, as well as the bull landscape temple. That's the head of the bull. These are the chakras of the bull from Santiago to Compostela, originally down to Ephesus, but now it's from Constantinople. Um, but when it was as Ephesus, St. St. John was sent to Ephesus. St. James's brother was sent to Santiago. So you had the two brothers like twins, Gemini twins, at each end of the, of the bull of Europe, which is Zeus in disguise in the myth. Um, and then the other disciples went to other places, including Joseph Arimathea and so on, who came to, to Britain and set things in motion there. Um, and then eventually it becomes the swan through all their hard work. Well, in this 1604 star thing, what happens immediately is that the impulse is sent over from England, particularly from London, right over into the neck of the Swan of Europe, north of and south of the Ecksteiner, these magical stones, um, center of the German folk, folk myths, really. Um, great, great, oh, I've gone backwards. Hang on a moment. Um, So just south of the Eckstenstein and just north of the Eckstenstein, it's part of the throat of the swan. The heart of the swan is at Constance, Lake Constance and Constance itself. And then you go north, you've got the long neck, the brow chakra up in Jutland, in Danish Jutland, marked by Himmelberget, their sacred mountain. And then the crown chakra up in the Jotunheim mountains of Norway. And uh, this great axis coming right down to Fars Milan. And actually, to carry on doing it a pilgrimage route, you would go to Rome. Now, these, these two axes of the swan and of the bull 
were actually pilgrimage routes, famous pilgrimage routes, known as the, cro the Pilgrimage Cross of Europe. So it's, you know, people of old have known these things, or well, certain people have known, and they guided pilgrims to walk along these routes accordingly. Um, the one, one through the ball also acts as a trade route for most of the way as well. So it's a well-trodden route, moving and working with the energies of the earth. Now, this is all part of the Rosicrucian wisdom. They knew these things. They worked with these things. It was really very important. So it's time for these things to become much more, much more known nowadays because it's important. Working with nature, consciously with nature all the time, with the earth as a living, living being, a living creature. The mystery schools knew this and they worked with this. Or at least certain members of them did. So anyway, I'll show you this to show you the importance of bringing the impulse, Rosicrucian impulse, straight over, first of all, to this part of Germany. After that, it spread elsewhere as well. Um, this new, new impulse uh, brought to earth by Elias the artist, Elijah the artist. So the development in Protestant Germany, really the main focus of this, there were several focal points, but the main focus of this was um, with Moritz, the Landgrave of Hesse Kassel and, um, and his centre at Kassel. Um, now Moritz, I'll show you a picture of him. Moritz was known as the Learned. He was an Anglophile and a great patron of Rosicrucian alchemists as well as a medical as well as medical men. The link between him and England was very strong for many years. His father had been William IV of Hesse Castle, called William the Wise, who was a no notable patron of the arts and sciences and a pioneer in astronomical research, who founded the first European observatory in 1564 in his castle at Castle. And it was not only on friendly terms with the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, but was also himself responsible for calculating many stellar positions. Now here's, here's a map of the, of the centers of the German states at that time. And there's Castle there, just south and slightly east of the Eckensteiner. So you see where I'm pointing to now on the map. The spine of the swan spreads down here from Jutland, coming down here through the Eckensteiner and southwards to Constance, um, Lake Constance or Bodensee. In 1601, Moritz founded a temperance society at Kassel. He was brought up a Lutheran, but then in 1604, Moritz converted to Calvinism. And on the 17th of April 1604, Moritz wrote a letter mentioning the livery made in the form of a rose that was worn by many young gentlemen at Castle in his entourage. Interesting, isn't it? And at the same year in 1604, he built a roofed theatre called the Ottenaeum in Castle. And this building, which the oldest such in Germany, is still in existence. And Moritz acted as a patron to some acting troops and musicians, musicians such as John Dowland, and maintained a permanent company of English comedians at his court in Castle for years. And although drawn mainly from the Lord Admiral's men, some of the principals, principal actors had previously acted in Shakespeare's productions. By the mid 1590s, English actors usually called comedians were touring widely on the continent, which did a great deal to spread English influence and ideas in Germany to enthusiastically receptive audiences. I guess in those days, the, like nowadays, the Germans could speak English very well. <laughs> because I can't see English actors learning German that well, but still maybe they did, maybe I'm wrong. But I think the plays were always produced in English, English plays. Um, Moritz organized and controlled an extensive hermetic alchemical circle and established what were probably Europe's best laboratories at Kassel. 
Moritz also established a university of Marburg, the University of Marburg, as Germany's first Calvinist university. Um, then you can see Marburg there, south of the Eckensteiner and southwest of Kassel. This, this university had a great chemistry faculty under the direction of Johann Hatmann, as well as medical faculties, which became the powerhouse of academic Rosicrucianism in Europe. Important to note, so there it is, Marburg, in this throat area of the swan. And Marburg University maintained a close relationship with Exeter College, the only Calvinist college at Oxford, part of Oxford University. Then in 1613, the marriage of Frederick V and Princess Elizabeth happened. Now, Frederick V, the Elector of, Palat of the Palatinate, was Moritz's neighbour. And in 1613, he married Princess Elizabeth, the daughter of James I of England, sixth of Scotland. So this was a big, big occasion. The marriage took place here in England, in London, but the Heidelberg is, is the centre, the, the capital of, of Frederick V, the Elector of the Platinate. Again, on this spine of the swan, right here. It's, it's, it's on, on the edge of the, the great river Rhine. Immediately after their marriage, Frederick and Elizabeth established a center of Rosicrucian activity at their castle in Heidelberg. So it is possible that the publication of the Rosicrucian manifestos were timed to coincide with and aid this new beginning. The manifestos themselves were, were, were printed in castle there. The existence of these manifestos in manuscript form can, however, be traced back to at least 1610, since the composer, alchemist and physician Adam Hasselmeyer, in a reply to the farmer printed in 1612, states that he had seen a manuscript copy of the farmer in Tyrol in 1610. It was also circulating in manuscript form in both Castle and Marburg from at least July 1611. When published, the farmer was prefaced by the universal and general reformation of the whole wide world. Now, this was a German translation of the 77th advertisement of Triano Boccalini's Satiri, sorry, I can't pronounce this right, Satira Raguaguli de Parnasso. Well, the English tr translation that is advertisements from Parnassus. I think I'll give up trying to translate this Latin, speak the Latin. Um, it was first published, the book was first published in Venice in 1612. It had 100 advertisements or passages, and the 77th one was the key one used um, to prefix the farmer. Boccolini, who died in 1613, was a friend of Paolo Sarpi and a member of his circle of Italian intellectuals. None, another member of Sarpi's circle was Galileo, who like Sarpi often communicated with Francis Bacon. So th this is, these communications were kept up throughout this Renaissance, you know, these key players, right from Italy through France, Germany and England, all communicating with each other as best they could, all, and, and traveling when they could to each, each other. Now, this reformation of the whole wide world is clearly meant to be read together with the farmer, with the two working together in partnership and thereby operating the Gemini principle. So if ever you do read the farmer, you must really read this universal general reformation first. The two go together. The reformation is, is um, a skit, if you like. It's about Apollo on Parnassus and so on. And, and anyway, for those of you who studied Bacon and so on, um, you'll know how it relates to Bacon. Bacon was known as an Apollo, like a second Apollo. 
Chancellor of Parnassus. The farmer fraternitatis Rosy Cross is concerned with setting in motion a universal and general reformation of the whole wide world by means of partly renewing and reducing all arts to perfection. And it presents an allegorical history of, Fra of Fra CRC, the father of the fraternity, whose tomb was metaphorically opened in 1604. <coughs> Excuse me. The Confessio, which published the following year, again, this time, Confessio is like a twin to the farmer, just as the Reformation was a twin to the farmer that, that year. Then the following year, the Confessio makes a twin to both of them. And the Confessio means the confession of the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross. And this completes the story that was begun in the farmer. And it contains a section entitled A Brief Consideration of the more secret philosophy, which quotes verbatim from the first 13 theorems of John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica. John Dee, as I've mentioned before in this series, he was a pretty important guy in this whole thing. And in fact, he, there are, there are um, drawings and other things to show that Dee seems to have been in charge of the Rosicrucians in the early days, 1570s and early 80s. And then he passed on the lamp to Francis Bacon, who then took over the leadership of the Rosicrucian fraternity. And, um, and also I'm doing certain, well, Alan Green has been researching this a lot and I'm doing one or two podcasts with him about it because he's working with the cipher that D created, which he passed on to Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon, as you know, was already a great cipher expert himself, and he learned even more from D, and they worked together um, in this. Um, anyway, coming back to Moritz in 1615, Moritz founded at Cassel the Societas Christiana, the Christian Society, which functioned as a chapter of the Rosicrucians. The chapter was made up of Moritz plus 12 officers. It included Prince Frederick Henry, the future Stadtholder of the Netherlands, the Landgrave Louis of Hesse Darmstadt, the Marquis Jean George of Brandenburg, the Elector Frederick III, Prince Christian of Anhalt, Johannes Valentin Andrea, Michael Meyer, Raphael Eglinus, Anthony Theis, and Professor Youngman. All of them are pretty important. So I'm just going to pick one or two out for us. Michael Meyer. Well, in 1608, Michael Meyer went to Prague. And in 1609, he formally entered the service of Rudolf II as his physician and imperial counselor. Rudolf raised him to the hereditary nobility and gave him the title of Imperial Count Palatine. But Meyer visited England regularly between 1611 and 1616, where he first heard of the Rosicrucians. This is something he says in his, his printed works. First heard of the Rosicrucians in England. He became Moritz's court physician in 1619, and Meyer was a very good friend of Robert Flood. Then there's Johann Daniel Milius. Alongside, alongside Andrea, Flood and Meyer, Milius ranked as one of the most eminent Rosicrucian writers. He was a composer for the lute and a writer on alchemy. He was the son-in-law of Johannes Hartmann and eventually became Moritz's personal physician. He was born at Wetter, or Wetter in present-day Hesse, Germany, and he went on to study theology and medicine at the University of Marburg. He was the brother-in-law and pupil of Johann Hartmann, the great professor of chemistry at Marburg University. 
1616, while still a medical student, Milius published Duncan Burnett's Iatrochimus. Don't know what that means. And in 1618, he published his own alchemical work, the Opus Medicino Chemicum, or the Opus Medico Chemicum. Um, and in 1620, he published his Thesaurus Gratarium, a collection of pieces for the lute at Frankfurt. And in 1622, he published his Philosophia Reformata. So again, he was another one very connected with this whole Rosicrucian circle. Then there's Johann Valentinus Andrei, very famous. Many people think he wrote the Manif Rosicrucian Manifestos, but he himself said he didn't do that. But he did write something else that's very important. He, Andrea was born in Herrenberg and in 1601 moved to Tübingen with his mother after his father died, where he studied theology and natural sciences from 1604 to 1606. He befriended Christoph Bessold, who encouraged Andrea's interest in esotericism. And as in his, in his autobiography, Andrea claims that he wrote The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosacross round about 1605. This was actually published in 1616, but Andrea said he wrote it round about 1605 whilst he was there in Tübingen. Now this Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosacross is essentially a continuation of the hyper, of the hypnorotagmachia Philophile, gosh, I can't pronounce that. Hypnorotomachia polyphile, or dream of polyphilus, wherein it is Christian Rosenkreutz rather than Pan who discovers Venus naked in bed in her underground bedchamber. The chemical wedding contains a reproduction of John Dee's monad symbol, which I mentioned before. So it's a very important book and you know, it's, it's, it's um, well, he, he, uh, Andrew referred to as a jest. Well, Shakespeare's comedies are jests. Sometimes the greatest truths are told in, in jests, in other words. That's why you have the jester or, or um, whatnot in, in, in the courts of kings and so on, because they, they can phrase wisdom or advice in, in funny forms so that the the king or whoever it is uh, takes can take note, note of it. He, whereas if somebody told him, somebody else told him that straight off, he'd say, oh, I'm not going to do that. How dare you tell me these things? <laughs> so like many leaders, they like to think they've come up with the idea first. So the jesters are very trained in <laughs> passing things on in such a way that the emperor thinks, oh, a good idea and then he announced it as, as his idea you know it's that sort of thing well this chemical wedding of christian rosacross was described by andrea as as such a jest funnily enough modern writers some modern writers anyway tend to dismiss it saying oh andrea wasn't serious of all this he wasn't serious about rosicrucianism he just poo 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 pooed the whole thing and so on like that because they missed the whole meaning what what a jest means um and although Andrew went on to become a priest and so on, um, he was imbued with this whole stuff. So, you know, you can't tell a parcel by its wrappings. So from 1606 to 1608, Andrea, for those two years, taught young noblemen, such as the sons of Duke Augustus of Lüneburg, with whom he was on friendly terms. And he hiked with his students through Switzerland, France, Austria, and Italy. And when the education was finished, an extensive correspondence began between Andrea and his former pupils, the Duke's sons. And these letters were written with reference to literature, theology, and personal affairs. Andrea himself became very well versed in the cryptography later published by Duke Augustus under the pseudonym of Gustavus Salenus. And Andrea was the author of a booklet on the subject, which he presented to his former pupils. Moreover, 30 years later, on February the 26th, 1647, Andrea wrote to the Duke's sons, 
that he had bought a house in Stuttgart to which he had given the name of Domus Seleniana. So just to show you how connected Andrea, all this time, even though he'd become a priest, he's connected all this time with the Rosicrucians and with Duke Augustus and, and others of, of, of the whole Rosicrucian group abroad in, in, in Germany and, and in England. In 1608, Andrea returned to Tübingen where he met the Paracelsian Tobias Hess and became a member of his circle. The circle was known as the Tübingen Circle. And then from 1610 to 1612, Andrea traveled. And in 1612, he came back to Tübingen and resumed his theological studies and was ordained into the Lutheran ministry in 1614, after which he became a deacon in Weihingen and in 1620, a priest in Kull. I think you pronounce it that way. And in 1619, he published his quite a famous book called Christianopolis. It's a utopia. And it contains similar features to Bacon's New Atlantis, such as a high regard for teachers, approaching the world from both a scientific and artistic perspective, and the formation of a college or society which would unite all men of learning and provide them with the necessary means to carry out their researches. Now, here's an engraved portrait of Valentin Andres, interesting one, because you'll see around, around him are all these coats of arms of the various families he's, his family is connected with, but here you've got an F, Joker, and a B. Interesting thought, isn't it? And um, the candle there is still shown burning by his right shoulder, and the moon above the hourglass on his left shoulder. These are Kabbalistic symbols of right and left arm and hand, respectively. And um, and, and so there's a lot of Kabbalah in this, which means cipher and, um, and other things as well to be seen in this. There's at least one other special engraving that was done of him, uh, which helped to give the game away as well. The Tübingen Circle was a circle of friends, which in 1608 consisted of 12 members. It was founded by Tobias Hess, a German lawyer knowledgeable in Paracelsian medicine, alchemy, and the Bible. And the circle were focused on deepening their knowledge of the Bible, exploring nature, and living a life based on love for God and love for one's neighbor, the great commandments as given by Jesus. And they desired and anticipated a golden age, such as foretold by Joachim of Fiore. They, they, this is completely what Bacon and his group and the Rosicrucians in England were also focused on. Um, another member was Christopher Bessold. He is a law professor, Kabbalist and mixed mystic. He was another key member of the circle and he possessed a good esoteric library knew nine languages, including Arabic and Hebrew, and had been a close friend of Johann Kepler in the early 1590s. Then there was Daniel Mogling, who was an alchemist, physician, and astronomer. He is a scion of a prominent family of scholars and scientists in Tübingen, where he studied medicine. And he was related to Johann Valentin Andrea, who visited often. Now, Daniel became enamored of the Rosicrucian ideal and wrote a number of treatises in the space of a few years expounding the Rosicrucian message. And from 1621 to 1635, he became personal physician and court astronomer to Philip III, Landgrave of Hesse Butchbach. He translated Philip Sidney's novel Arcadia into German. And he's believed to be the pseudonymous author known as Theophysis. Sorry, not pronunciation bad again. Theoph Theophilus Schweigart Constantians of Speculum Sophicum Rhodostoroticum, 
meaning the mirror of the wisdom of the rosy cross that was published in 1618, which is a magnificent book. And I've, I've seen an, an original copy of this once. Um, this is the frontispiece of the book that I'm showing you now. And it, this building on wheels represents the College of the Rosy Cross, which can be anywhere. You know, it's, it, well, it exists in the metaphysical realms. It's a state, of, it's a level of consciousness that you can reach when you reach that Rosicrucian level of initiation. Um, but th this is a lovely symbol of it <laughs> on wheels that so can move everywhere. It's got wings it can fly with <laughs> and so on. And it's, it's suspended from the hand of God. And um, on each side of it, you can see a, a star shining its light down from the top right-hand corner, the top left-hand corner of the picture. And one is, it represents the supernova in a firecus. There's the serpent bearer firecus with the serpent there coming down 1604 number there. And then the other side, you've got the star, new star or nova that appeared in Cygnus. And there's Cygnus the swan coming down, um, making this become visible, as it were, to the general public. And there's a lot of other things in that picture too. The, the actual title page is this one, and it's, it's designed Kabbalistically according to the Tree of Life pattern and so on. So you can, some of you might love to analyze it like I've done. But at the top, you can see the, the winged sun, like going back to ancient Egypt with the winged sun, and in it, the, the, the name of Jehovah in special pattern. And it refers to the Rosicrucian motto, Sub Umbra Alarum Tuarum, which appears at the end of the concluding paragraph of the Farmer Fraternitatis Rosae Crucis, where it is addressed to Jehovah. Now this motto, Rosicrucian motto, which means under the shadow of thy wings, Jehovah, is derived in particular from Psalm 36, verse seven, and to quote it, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Or more correctly, how excellent is thy loving kindness, Jehovah. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Now, there are several other psalms where it references this shadow of the wings. But 36 is the particular one chosen because 36 is the number of squares in the border of the 10 by 10 mosaic floor, which border signifies the universe. The wings refer to the eagle's wings as symbolic of the protective radiance of the light and grace of God. And the eagle's wings are equivalent to the hawk's wings of, used in ancient Egypt, wherein the hawk was the symbol of Horus. Now Horus's name in, in Egyptian is spelt K-H-R, which translated into Greek gives you the Cairo. So in other words, Horus is the Egyptian equivalent of Christos or Christ. And the Cairo monogram, if you didn't know already, which is called the Christogram, is the original of the Rose Cross. Some of you know that because I've talked about it and you might find out for yourself, but others of you might not know that. So it gives more significance to the Rosicrucians calling themselves the Christian Rose Cross Fraternity. Uh, very interesting. Just quickly switching to England for a moment. But in 1618, this an emblem book was published called The Mirror of Majesty. Um, and in emblem six in it, called Sub Umbra Alarum Tuarum, was dedicated to Francis Bacon. Now going back to Germany, another important person was Augustus the Younger, Duke of Brunswick and Lüneburg. He was born 1579 and died in 1666. Augustus was born at Dannenberg Castle, 
the seventh child of Duke Henry of Brunswick, Lüneburg. He studied in Rostock, Tübingen and Strasbourg, then travelled on a grand tour through Italy, France, the Netherlands and England. And then back in Germany in 1604, aged 25, he took up residence in Hitzsacker. I'm sorry, you German people are listening to me. I can't pronounce very well. Hitzsacker. Now, this is a little town 45 kilometers east of Lüneburg. And there he spent the next three decades with a small court continuing his studies. And he kept up an active correspondence with Johann Valentin Andrea and also with Francis Bacon in England, who he knew very well. And then under the pseudonym Gustavus Solanus, he wrote Chess All the King's Game, a book on chess published in 1616, and then Cryptomenetices et, Crypt et Cryptographia, a book on cryptography published in 1624. Now this was published at exactly the same time that Bacon published his Latin version of the advancement of learning following straight on from the publication of the Shakespeare folio of plays in 1603. The three books really should be read together and then they are intended to be read together, I'm sure. So this is what I'm showing is the title page of the, of the book published in 1624. Um, the suit is published under the pseudonym that the Duke used, pseudonym Gustavus Salanus. It's a cryptic reference to his name, Gustavus Anagrams to Augustus. And Salanus is a play on the Greek goddess of the moon, Selena, and also plays upon the name Lunaburg, the lunar or moon castle where the work was printed. And those of you who know Ben Jonson's works, you might know Ben Jonson often refers to the Rosicrucians as the men in the moon. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? these links. The moon also is a symbol in Kabbalah of the left-hand side of the tree of life. And it references the holy intelligence or mind, the divine mind or consciousness, which can, be, can know the truth. So Kabbalah is associated with that. So men in the moon are Kabbalists. They're studying Kabbalah. They're studying the wisdom in order to get to know it. Um, that, that's what it really means behind it. Now, this book on cryptography is largely based on earlier works by Johannes Trithemis, who is one of the great forerunners of the Rosicrucians, great, great leader of um, although he was a monk, he was a great leader of the secret societies. Now, Francis Bacon, who was then Lord Chancellor of England, was expected in Augsburg in 1620 as they began the discussion of how to illustrate the title. They'd been communicating by letter for some years in preparation for printing and publishing this book. So Francis Bacon was very much involved in it um, all the time, and he was a good friend. Um, of the Duke. So just to remind you what Francis Bacon looks like as Lord Chancellor, here's a picture of him. <laughs> Portrait by Paul Van Soma, which hangs in Gorhambury, the Gorhambury collection. In 1635, Duke Augustus received the Principality of Wolfenbottle, but because of the ongoing war that was happening then, he had to stay at Dangwarder Road Castle in Brunswick and didn't move to the castle of Wolfenbottle until 1642. This is pretty big, fantastic castle. Um, it looks a bit different nowadays because a lot of it got destroyed and then rebuilt again. But here's a picture of how it looks in 1654 when the Duke was there. And at the Schloss Wolfenbüttel, Prince Augustus, as he was called then, created a great library called the Bibliotheca Augusta. This was a library housing what was then the largest collection of books and manuscripts north of the Alps, 
known now as the Herzog August Bibliothek. And I'd like to end just showing you a picture of Augustus in that library at Wolfenbüttel. And also to note that after the 1648 peace to Westphalia, the Wolfenbüttel lands recovered quickly under the Duke's capable rule. He was a very good man. And the key, key in all the Rosicrucian work, or one of, the, one of the two men keys, the Rosicrucian work in Germany, really. So that's where I'd like to end. So I hope I haven't gone too quickly through it for you, <laughs> but just to give you a sense of how it moved from England to that part of Germany to let the swan sing, sing its music, sing its wisdom, which then spread all over Europe and, and the world ever since. And now it's coming back. Well, it's all in preparation for what's happening now. What is going to happen now? What is going to happen now? We don't know yet. Um, but we've been prepared for it. And um, let's hope it all goes well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>